So we are coming to the conclusion of the speeches. We have uh, one uh, more uh, speaker left. Uh, that is our friend from Belarus. Uh, now Belarus is finally famous uh, after what uh, has happened in uh, Minsk. And I don't, uh, I don't introduce anymore the country. No, you, uh, you should normally know uh, where is it and how it, it gas. Uh, but we are speaking not about uh, politics. It's completely indifferent to our topics, at, uh, 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 at least today tonight. So please, uh, Grigory, Grigory Sinenko, you, you uh, could uh, um, make your, uh, the panel is, is yours, please. Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm a nomad. So I was born in Belarus, but now I'm studying in Moscow. So it's, uh, it's a superposition of two locations. Uh, but uh, I would like to greet all the participants of this conference and thank the organizers for creating such a great platform for discussions, particularly Mr. Alexander Dugin. A more detailed version of my presentation can be found on the Paideuma TV site in the materials of this conference. And this uh, will be a 10 minutes short, short presentation. And the stated topic of my talk is formulated as a question. What are the pitfalls of radical ontology or metaphysics? In my report, I will try to touch upon the problems of understanding the category, which in different philosophical systems is called as non-being, totally other, a base, and so on. Or it can be called the true transcendence in Yuri Manleyev's words. So what do I mean when I refer to the abyss? Let's start with, in some sense, opposite category which I name as the everything. Talking about the everything, I am talking about all things, properties, and metaphysical systems all together. The everything is a construct that includes any statement, object, description, which can be even, contradict, even contradictory to the other. Moreover, anything that uh, has a certain property will definitely be absorbed by the everything. The semantic content of the property in this case does not matter. Every other statement generates properties. Anything that uh, we will never think about at all will have the property of not thinking about it. Anything that is inaccessible to us has a corresponding property. The property can be expressed by an adjective, for example, black, endless, unimaginable, disappeared, or by a noun, for example, apple or god. And in general, by any kind of sentence, I would, uh, it would seem that the lack of distinction between substance and property is quite controversial here. However, the given apple and uh, the property to be a given apple is, no, is not different from me. Therefore, the everything includes all properties. Of course, the absence of a specific property is also a property. And speaking of the abyss, I'm talking about the fruit of the Gnostic intuition, which wants to speculatively leave my construct of the everything to get out of it, regardless the fact that anything is constantly absorbed by the everything. We can try to start our meditation on this concept as on the absence of all properties, but we should remember that if we do see any sign, any sense in this description, we are certainly in a trap of the everything. It is the question about the abyss that I call the last question of any metaphysical or ontological speculation. That is right. A Degerian question about Zion is an absolutely important and radical question, but it does not seem to me as the last. There is one more, a question about unbeing, about something out of being at all. We should think of the everything not as of an array of different things or laws, this is an array of all metaphysical descriptions or thoughts. This is an extremely difficult speculation based on contradictions which cannot be explained in this short presentation. But do remember, if we are looking into the everything, we will find that any ontological or metaphysical system or any description or object, it does not matter if it will be Heideggerian teaching about Zion, Christian metaphysics, God of Islamic monotheism or naive realism, or for example, the word green or the noun an apple 
they are all parts of the everything. Exactly from such category, their beast wants to escape. An easier task will not be truly the last question of metaphysics or ontology. So what is the abyss? We cannot give a certain answer, but what I can do now is to say that in any case, now any property, except for the above paradoxical absence of all properties, can be easily attributed to the everything, which at least will allow me to accumulate under this signifier the layers of diverse metaphysical doctrines that thought of their highest categories as of something that has some kind of certain properties, which seems to be a demonstration of the very useful classification tool for metaphysics. So how proposed approach works? Let's look on some examples. So Yuri Mamlev in his work The Destiny of Being says that, quote, God is only the body of the truly transcendent, speaking by the analogy, and not the essence of the transcendent, the latter is, as it were, the true darkness, the true ocean that surrounds reality. In relation to God, this darkness is the same as the spirit in relation to the body. Of course, taking into account that such an analogy is purely external in nature. And he also says that, uh, quote, the complete positivation of all negations, evil and death, are the cracks into the abyss, end quote. So, of course, if we are thinking about the abyss as of outer layer, of metaphysical nesting doll, or if we give a privilege to any practice, for example, to the practice of evil, that is considered as a way into the abyss, and if we think that any connection, even if you call it as anti-connection, can be established in the abyss, we are attributing a certain properties to the abyss, therefore, we are in the, in the trap of the everything. So let's, for example, now look at the philosophy of a prominent Islamic thinker, Haidar Jamal. The general line of his thought will be the insistence on a fundamental distinction between true monotheism and Genonian perennialism, and in general various forms of teachings about God at the highest concentration of all forms of being. Uh, Jamal's monotheism is a doctrine of radical opposition. Uh, God is radically not identical. Uh, God is not identical to the world, is extremely apophatic and the only one directly opposite to the cataphatic unification of all. But the problems here are obvious. The very speaking through the prophets, that is the participation of God in a certain plan for humanity, is certainly a property. The status of the creator of this world is a property. Being not identical to something, irreducibility to something, is a property. Thus, even so understood God, who is the radical opposition to everything is taken in, is eaten by a non-naively introduced category of, of new everything in my understanding. So let's mention well-known author, pseudo Dionysius the Aropagite. His philosophy, what is especially remarkable for us, is filled with contradictions and intentional contradictions. It is well known that the corpus Repagiticum contains both cataphatic writings and a purely apophatic writing on mystical theology, which contradicts to cataphatic statements. In other words, uh, God is both goodness and not goodness at the same time. The Godhead and not such exists and non-existent, but un unfortunately, we already know that any extremely paradoxical property is nevertheless a property. Therefore, the enumeration of all properties will at best lead us to the intuition about the everything, but not to the intuition about the abyss. And in conclusion, I say some words about the philosophy of the New Age Gnostic, Matthew Whiteman, in his article, The Serpent's Servants, Disciples of Ayn, introduces the, an unimaginable metaphysical category, Ayn, which is radically different to the Ayn Sof, so he works in the framework of Kabbalistic metaphysics. And Ayn is the state of impossibility of any possibility, and Ayn Sof is the state of possibility of all possibilities. But of, unfortunately, even in this marginal thought, this strange category, category named Ayn has certain properties. Uh, he, is, he says that uh, this category coexisted with the possibility of Ayn Sof within the framework of some difficult to describe construct of void. And uh, he describes Ayn as uh, something where there is no creation, there are no God, there are no nothing. This is the ultimate oblivion beyond oblivion, the oblivion of oblivions. But these are certain properties. They are unimaginable, they are contradictory, but 
they still are properties. And these property mistakes seem to be a real problem for me. So for the conclusions, I would say first, a view is possible, a lens is possible, according to which even the most radical teachings and schools of thought concerning the subject of the abyss could not overcome some of the property mistakes. And the second, from my point of view, the basis of the non-naive discourse about the abyss can be formulated in the language of contemporary philosophy, even with uh, all the requirements of modern academia. So thank you for your attention, and I will be glad to receive any criticism or comments. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Grigori. Very interesting. And this category of abyss was certainly uh, central to uh, all group that I belong from the beginning. Um, for uh, Yuri Mamlev, you have cited Gidar Jamal, about whom Mayrim Aitkulova uh, has uh, has spoken. We could mention the other great uh, one of uh, one of the three greatest uh, thinkers. I think Evgeny Golovin. Uh, and here there is uh, um, participates in our conference Sergei Zhigalkin, a Russian philosopher who was uh, one of the friends uh, of all of them, all three of them. So that is really some kind of uh, uh, of heritage, of metaphysical heritage of Yuzhansky period, like uh, of Mamlev or of Hedar Jemal. Uh, uh, Eugene Golovin, and I'm very, very uh, happy that we have mentioned uh, this great mind because they have prepared precisely the things we, we are discussing. Uh, that, that they have discovered traditionalism, uh, they have uh, created the, the soil and ground, metaphysical ground for the concepts on theory of radical subjects, uh, subject and all of other topic we are discussing today. So it is real homage uh, to, to them uh, and a, a really, op op really opportune. So now, uh, now about, about uh, abyss, I, I, I would like as well to, uh, to recall very interesting understanding of Heidegger. Heidegger have uh, dedicated to the concept of uh, uh, abyss, a very important, uh, important, uh, important passages uh, in his in his works. Uh, and he has said that uh, the real ground, Grund, uh, must uh, be abyssal must be abyss. Uh, 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 the only real ground must uh, to, must be non-ground. Urgrund oder Grund muss abgrund sein. Abgrund, abyss. Uh, that, uh, that means that if Heidegger has explained it very, uh, very beautifully, uh, very beautiful. So he has said, if uh, there is the other ground uh, outside of this ground on which this ground is situated, it's just not ground. It, it's not just something that is uh, uh, in the middle. It is not ground, but the only real ground should, be, should have no ground uh, 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 beneath. So, uh, but what is a beast of upground that has, has no ground, uh, ground? So that is very, very dialectical and very metaphysically important definition of the uh, abyss. Abyss is the fundamental, is the fundament and apophatic tradition, apophatic tradition of, uh, of Plato, of or Christian Platonism as uh, Dionysus of Areopagate, uh, uh, they fit that fits in this in this uh, in, in this definition as well as dialectic of uh, uh, Schelling, uh, Hegel, and Böhme. There is one one more uh, writer and philosopher we need to concentrate our attention on is the first German philosopher, as Hegel has uh, has called him, Jakob Böhme. That is greatest mind, if we could get through his naturalist 
Paracelsian Hermetic language, we arrive to the really the, the precious uh, uh, aspect of, of the real the fundamental uh, fundamental roots of the of, of the metaphysic. That explains many things. That explains Schelling at least. That uh, explains uh, 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 through Schelling uh, Hegel and Heidegger and many other things. So I would like to to, to and uh, uh, Böhme has uh, uh, has dedicated to the concept of abyss, to description of abyss, of uh, abyss as dialectic between Herbigkeit and Bitterkeit. Um, uh, that was very important uh, uh, description of the abyss. So the abyss can be described in correct metaphysical way and put inside of Schellengian concept of B. Schelling has concept of three, three, uh, uh, three principles. Co that is direct uh, definition, continuation of Jakob Böhme uh, vision of uh, three principles. And Schelling uh, calls that uh, A, uh, that equal to B, the first principle. Um, A, that is not equal to B and equal only to A, that is second principle. And that is third A, that is spirit precisely, that is totally indifferent uh, um, to the being to or, or not being. So that is an extremely important way uh, to describe the abyss. So my, my, my uh, remark to uh, your uh, presentation, very interesting indeed, uh, is that there are the theories the, of description of the abyss and there are philosophical schools how abyss was put inside of theology and ontology. And that is not the chance, not a casual, that precisely Schelling we, we find out in the beginning of Russian philo religious philosophy. And we have no other philosophy than religious, than Solovyov, Sofiology, Florensky, and uh, Bulgakov. And they were attracted not so much by Schopenhauer, by Kant, absolutely no, no by Kant, by, or by Hegel, but by Schelling. Schelling is the key to Russian philosophy. We have only one kind of not fully uh, established philosophical tradition that was Russian religious tradition, philosophy that is called Sophiology, Solovyov, Florensky, Bulgakov, and all, and Slavophiles as well, and all of them were inspired directly by Schelling. More orthodox, Christian orthodox, more metaphysical, more, more uh, Eckhart, more, uh, uh, more mystical orthodox, more mo Mount Athos, more uh, Essekast uh, philosopher, and more uh, closer to Russian, Russian uh, uh, and Greek, I, I would say, uh, metaphysical tradition. So, but abyss, uh, it's really important term that we need to, to explore more, and I agree, that's one of the of the term that should be uh, uh, should be um, uh, put in the center of academical of philosophy. So uh, we should speak about the horror, terror, uh, um, subhuman, uh, superhuman, abyss, uh, radical subject with no with no fear. It should be, be uh, Fichte understood the science as well as Schelling precisely as such. This, uh, only, only, only deep, really deep thing could be scientific. And we should, uh, uh, Husserl, Husserl has suggested to uh, revise all, all, all the context of modern science because they have lost their rela relation to the reality, to the metaphysical foundations, and they uh, uh, have ended uh, to be modern sciences. They have ended, they have stopped to be scientific. They, they are pure hallucination. We need to restore to the real science uh, outside of this, of this sh charlatanism uh, of, of, of modernity. The real science, it is precisely where uh, mm, phenomenology or German classical philosophy uh, is and where uh, Russian religious philosophy is. As, for example, the real basis for economy was laid in Serge Bulgakov concept of the philosophy of, of the economy, the great uh, metaphysical sociological work. So, 
uh, very uh, important important uh, point. So please, uh, Grigori. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Dugan, for very detailed comment for my speech. And uh, you are absolutely right. Um, the discourse about the abyss exists, and it, and it is very large. It is quite developed. But for me, uh, I think that we can uh, apply more speculative purity to that. Because uh, what I don't like is that abyss is often considered as the source and the platform on which uh, dialect, dialectics starts and on which being is uh, emerged. But the involvement in the dialectics seems to be uh, the property that makes this category, the abyss, not radical enough. I would, I would say that in this way, I think you understand me. And uh, for example, there are lots of other questions. For example, when we are, speak about absolutely apophatic God, and uh, Merim also mentioned uh, the philosophy of Gedar Jamal, as I am. When we speak about the apophatic God, but we are saying that he is a creator, for example, he speaks uh, fro from the prophets. When we are saying that there is a plan for humanity of this absolutely apophatic God, there is a, a contradiction, a radical contradiction, and it should be um, thought about. It, we should discuss this on a, I think, very pure speculative level. It, so it's an open question, it's a large question, and uh, you're absolutely right, the discourse is, but I, th I think that there are lots of opportunities for developing that. And uh, okay. it will always um, have, uh, um, this discourse have an opportunity to um, be integrated in the discourse of theology and so on. So. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, I think that that's enough. Thank you. Uh, you remind me. You you have remind me about the way uh, our discussion with uh, uh, Gedar Jamal were, because when um, uh, when uh, from time to time he uh, he formulated the uh, radical radical concept about a position between not being and being, and that was precisely Jamalian point to 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 make them. Um, pure metaphysical separation from uh, non, not being that uh, uh, doesn't create as well, for example. Uh, and this pure transcendence, he, he, he wanted to secure at any price pure transcendence. And uh, where I have, um, I, I, I've, I've mentioned, uh, for example, that um, Basilides, uh, in, uh, Basilidian Gnostics uh, and some um, radical Hindu traditions and some other, um, uh, other uh, or Bome or Schelling, uh, so the same, he was very, very angry. He became very angry because uh, uh, if uh, there is something for Jamal that, that he was wrong, he need to, to find the new way to define his uh, metaphysical position, because if there was something like that, so he was wrong, he should continue to purify his metaphysical, uh, metaphysical intuition and inspiration until the moment when there will be nothing comparable in the, uh, in the history of metaphysics. That was precisely his ethic, metaphysical ethic, to, to give to the uh, transcendence uh, the absolute purity purity or that could not if something uh, but at the same time I, I could I, I, uh, I can not uh, help not to mention Scott Eugena who has said that uh, in the end that should be God that will uh, not create so in the beginning there was God who has created uh, natura naturans, uh, and at the end of, of, of the metaphysical cycle, there will be the God that will not create. So uh, that will th that idea to put the radical transcendence at the end, at not 
and at the beginning. Very interesting idea that we find in German philosophers as well. But uh, I, I think uh, that uh, that is very important. I, I think that the, the, uh, the philosophy of Hedar Jamal, it is not the one special case of Islamic uh, thought or Isla Islamic th theology. It is the, the, the very special thing. It is very special theory that we need, um, we need to study and learn very carefully trying to be closer to Jamal himself, uh, Jamal himself, and that is not easy. Uh, and I think that could be as well the topic, particular topic, and very, very important topic to ask.